So to start with IOC, the Intergovernmental Oceanographic Commission of UNESCO, the United Nations uh, Organization for Education, si Science and Culture. Uh, IOC was established in 1960 at the, the UNESCO Intergovernmental Conference in Copenhagen, it was, and there the, the countries uh, agreed that uh, there was a need to, to better coordinate ocean re uh, research around the world and, and to work together as countries. So they established IOC at that time. Uh, so uh, to now we have 147 member states. And according to our statutes, we are uh, the only UN uh, body that specializes in ocean science, observations and services, data information exchange, and capacity building. That's really our mandate. And we also are recognized under the UN Convention on the Law of the Sea as an international competent organization for marine scientific research and transfer from marine technology. Um, so the IOC vision is really we need strong scientific understanding and systematic observations of the, of the ocean to underpin sustainable development and global governance for healthy ocean, for global, regional, and national in management of risks and opportunities from the ocean. So really obser doing observations, doing data management, doing science is really the f fundamental to better understand the ocean, to build the knowledge and to apply that knowledge. And talking about sustainable development, there's a very important development at the UN level, which are, is called the Sustainable Development Goals, which is the post-2015 agenda of the Millennium uh, Goals. And now we have a standalone goal for the ocean. Of, out of the 17 goals, we have goal 14, life below water, to conserve and sustainably use the ocean seas and marine resources for sustainable development. And one of the key documents was the blueprint and the future that we want which, uh, which IUC was very much enga engaged in. So that will be an important framework for, uh, for next year's 2020-2030. So the IUC Secretariat, uh, here we are in the project office in Ostend, the IUC project office for IUD, but the, uh, the headquarters is in Paris w within UNESCO. Uh, it's also the operational support unit and all, actually all the blue uh, uh, BARTs uh, are in Paris, so also the sections, you have the Ocean Science section, the Tsunami Unit, the Ocean Observation Services section, and the Marine, Marine Policy and Regional Coordination section is all in Paris. And all the, the blocks in yellow are actually decentralized offices. So you have, IU, have IUD here in Ostend, which also does, is responsible for capacity development. You have three regional uh, sub-commissions, one in the West Pacific, one for Car uh, Caribbean, and one for Africa. And then you have a number of support offices for the Tsunami Unit, uh, for, uh, for Goose, uh, for the Ocean Observations, and for the harmful algal blooms, and one in Copenhagen. So in total, there we are, IUC is uh, not so big. Uh, we have 40 staff members. Uh, the majority, though, is extra budgetary, project-based. Uh, here in, in, in Ostend, at the moment, we are nine people. Uh, there will be one more joining us, uh, hopefully, next month. So there, the, what is IUC doing? Uh, we have six functions in IUC, which is uh, doing the observation systems and data management, doing ocean research. Uh, on that science and, and, and data, we try we do uh, try to build early warning uh, systems and, and, and tools. We use that information to create information for policy and assessment, and apply that knowledge for sustainable management and governance. And cutting across all the activities is capacity development. You need capacity development for everything to make sure that all member states are able to participate in the IOC global programs. Here I have tried to add all the logos of all the programs and, and, and projects that IOC is involved in, and it's quite a lot. So OBIS is actually just one of them as part of, of IOD program, but it really goes to ocean literacy, uh, observ observation system, data management, integrated coastal uh, research, uh, integrated coastal zone management, um, yeah, etc. Up to engaging within policy uh, at the UN level. 
So IOD is one of the old is the, actually the oldest programmer in, in IOC. It started in, in 1961. IOD is International Ocean uh, Oceanographic Data and Information Exchange Program. So the member states early on recognized that uh, if you want countries to work together, well the first thing that you need to do is to share the data and information amongst yourself, amongst the countries, and also use agreed international data standards to make it possible to integrate data. So that was really already recognized uh, from the early on, so they established an IOD program for that. So the IOD vision is a comprehensive and integrated ocean data information system serving the broad and diverse needs of IOC member states for both routine and scientific use. And since 2005, IOD got uh, its own project office here in Belgium with uh, substantial support from the Flanders government of Belgium. I tried to list a number of uh, projects uh, uh, that IOD program is implementing. So we've heard about Ocean Teacher before this morning. There's also Ocean Data Portal, Ocean Data Practices, Ocean Expert, Expert Database, Ocean Docs Database for Publications. We have OBIS, OBIS AMF Data, trying to get uh, uh, more than just pieces of occurrences in OBIS. TIPS, Development of Information Products and Services, ADAT for ARM from Algae, ICANN, the International Coastal Atlas Network, and so on, uh, World Ocean Database, uh, Quality Management Framework, etc. So IUD is also the, the program that is uh, taking care of the National Oceanographic Data Centers Network. At the moment, we have about 100 data centers in our network. Uh, so most of them are National Oceanographic Data Centers. Others have jo recently joined IOD as an associated data unit, which is not recognized as a national data center, but they do our uh, data management and are important in terms of data management. So also the OBIS nodes in IOD are either NODCs or ADUs. An important project that recently started in IOD is the Ocean Knowledge Platform. And that's actually trying to integrate all the the information and data products uh, in IOD and to provide a central access point. So basically what it will look like is building a dashboard when you enter a keyword or a country for example you get all the publications the data sets the capacity in that country the, uh, the institutions the experts and the training courses the services that are provided in that country uh, maps graphs indicators what are the what are the data systems? What are the observations being done in the country? How is the country involved in the activities of IOC? And we try to add some intelligy uh, to the to the to the portal, uh, providing uh, uh, s uh, links to experts with similar expertise, data sets with, uh, which are similar to the ones you're, you've looked up. So then. From IOC, IOD, we go to, to OBIS, the Ocean Biogeographic Information System. I will start my uh, presentation with this slide to give you an idea of the extent uh, of OBIS. So at the moment, we have 45 million uh, observations, and we are adding about 2 to 3 million per year, about 100 of 114,000 marine species. We, at the moment, we've, we have integrated 1,900 databases. And we have 500 institutions providing data in 56 countries. And so far, a bit more than 1,000 papers have cited OBIS. And some of them are really high impact uh, journal papers. And we're adding about 10 papers per month at the moment. OBIS it all started during the Census of Marine Life, which was a 10 year program uh, funded by the Alfred B. Sloan Foundation in the US. Uh, and OBIS was recognized as the data repository information component of the census of marine life. Uh, it was a real big program. Uh, they say, well, Sloan Foundation uh, gave 65 million US dollars to that program, but they say that, that was actually 10% of the entire budget because so many institutions, so many countries joined uh, the census of marine life. So, but uh, the Sloan Foundation, they really said in the beginning, we want OBIS to be the legacy of the Census of Marine Life, but we cannot. We can only fund it for 10 years. So after 10 years, uh, you'll need to find a new home. So then 
In 2009, at the 25th session of the IOC Assembly, the member states uh, adopted OBIS as being part of, uh, of IOC and as a project of IODE. And that was mainly because of three points, because they, they all agreed that the knowledge of oceans biodiversity is so, so important for national and global environmental issues that the responsibility for the OBIS continued success should be assumed by governments. And it was a new, uh, IUC was very strong in physical uh, climate and chemical data, but they, there was a, a gap in biology. So they required ocean biogeographic data to be added. And uh, of course, IUC didn't need to start from scratch. You, uh, they could adopt, they, there was the opportunity to uh, adopt OBIS as an existing global network uh, and associated research community. So that actually also changed a bit the, the mission of OBIS because in the sense of marine life, it was really a purely scientific mission trying to describe what lives, where lives and will live in the ocean, really mapping uh, the biodiversity in the ocean. So now it's, we have, uh, and that's an important change, uh, a mandate under the under UNESCO IUC to contribute to the protection of marine ecosystems by assisting identifying marine biodiversity hotspots and large-scale ecological patterns in all ocean basins. And one of the objectives of setting that baseline for marine biodiversity assessment and monitoring. And OBIS is not just a database, it's really a global alliance as a network of hundreds of marine institutions that work together, uh, the data managers working together with scientists uh, to facilitate free and open access to data, to, to provide application of data and information on marine life. Uh, and also recently uh, at the UN General Assembly, uh, OPUS, they, they appreciated and recognized OPUS contribution to marine scientific research. So in terms of governance structure, so IUD is the program that we are uh, run under. So IUD uh, prog uh, programs in IUC can establish projects. And a, a steering group is meant to um, uh, steer uh, projects in IUD. So IUD in 2011 established the OBIS project and the steering group. The steering group is composed of all the node managers and we also have established uh, task teams. So we have a science advisory task team, a taxonomy task team, a training task team, a data task team and technical task team. Members of the task teams don't necessarily need to be part of the OBIS nodes. They can have, we can invite external experts to these task teams. We have three tier structure of OBIS nodes. So the central uh, international OBIS node is tier one. We have tier two OBIS nodes and we have tier three OBIS nodes. The tier two OBIS nodes have a bit more uh, responsibility in terms of quality control. Uh, all the quality, the, the, data, the quality of the data should be really up to standards. And they also have a, a mentory role for tier three nodes. So new nodes often come in as a tier three and have uh, a parent tier two to to, to to give to assist to assist them. After some time, they can become a tier two. So the steering group meeting we meet every year. So we discuss the activities, we discuss we discuss practices, best practices, and we propose recommendations and build a work plan. That work plan is then proposed to the uh, IUD uh, committee meeting. They approve the work plan. Then the IUD makes the recommendations of the work plan to the IUC assembly. So then it's the countries who agree on the work plan and, and, and uh, divide the budget that they have received from the UNESCO General Conference. So it's IUC assembly, the 147 member states that come together, mm -hmm. discuss the program of, of, of all the projects and programs and activities. But it's actually at the UNESCO General Conference, which is other member states, other representatives who decide on the budget. So it's a rather complex uh, structure, um, but th that's how it works when you're part of a uh, uh, United Nations body. So on system architecture, uh, as I said, we have 500 data providers at the moment. Oh. They are 
in turn harvested are uh, the data are integrated by national, re regional, or thematic OBIS nodes. Thematic nodes can be global uh, in, in, in scope. Um, so the OBIS nodes, they uh, receive the data. They can be in, in, in Excel sheets, they can be in IPT, uh, in whatever formats. They do all the processing, the quality control. And then every three months, we harvest the OBIS nodes. We do the integration and do a, num a few uh, Q Q QC steps as well, and do the indexing. Uh, so that's a cycle of, at the moment, every three months. And then we publish a new version of the database and make them available through the web portal, which is at the moment through the, web, through the mapper. And we create a number of products and maps and statistics. You can access data, of course, through the mapper. Uh, and then you can download the data. There's also a number of uh, OGC uh, web services. And you can actually uh, access the SQL database directly. Those things you will learn during this week. In terms of growth of data, there's really no uh, decline in the numbers, number of records that are added uh, to OBIS. So you can see after the end of the Sensor Marine Life, we had about 28 million records, about 800 data sets. But to keep the, the growth steady, so now we have 45 million records, uh, actually we have added 1,100 data sets. So the data sets are getting smaller and smaller. An average data set, to give you an idea at the moment, is 15,000 records. That's the average size. While in the beginning, in the, f in the first years of OBIS, in the data sets were 1 million records. So we, we picked the low-hanging fruits, uh, but it, I mean, to keep the, that pace, uh, we are adding all small pieces of the puzzle. Um, the majority fi is fish. 50% of all the records are fish records. But, uh, of course, you'll know that the phylog phylogenetic uh, diversity in the ocean is much higher than on land. So here you see an, uh, an overview of all the taxono major taxonomic groups. So, and within the economic exclusive zones, the EZs, we, since 1990, we have about 1 million observations in OBIS. And in, a in ABNG, in areas beyond national jurisdiction or the high seas, we have about 200,000 records. Even the open ocean is 50% of the, of the planet, so we don't have a lot of information from that part of the world. In terms of sampling effort per depth volume, so if you, if you squeeze the ocean into a 2D dimension, so every square re actually represents a volume uh, in the ocean, you can see that the majority of the records is from the surface and from the continental shelf. So it actually means that for 99% for of the ocean volume, we actually have less than 100 sampling events, less than 700 records, and less than, seven, less than 13 species per 10,000 cube kilometers. So and if you want to compare that with what we have from the continental shelf, there for the same volume, we have more than 13,000 sampling events, more than 250,000 records, and more than 2,000 species. So really, for 99% of the ocean, we know very, very little. But this, it's a work in progress. Here I, I present you a graph of uh, the decades. So at the, the x-axis, you, you see decades from 1900 up to 2010. And you have the latitude uh, zero, the, the equator. So really, global monitoring started in the 1950s. Uh, and progressively increased in the southern hemisphere. In the Arctic, uh, strangely, it goes up and down. Uh, same type of graph, but then from then showing the number of records by distance from the nearest coastline, there you really see that there's a cutoff. Uh, 2,000 kilometers is uh, very far away, so it's also very difficult to get uh, records uh, uh, from those most remote places. In terms of depth, we've, so we are sampling more and more, and we go deeper and deeper in the, in the ocean, um, except for the very uh, deepest places in the ocean. So it's really, I mean, most of, beyond 5,000 meters, uh, we have very, very little records. And it's actually decreasing that number. 
One of our projects is uh, DIPS, the Development of Information Products and Services to support ocean assessments, which is funded, uh, we got a grant from the Flemish government here in Belgium. So we hope to build some biodiversity indicators to support a number of ocean assessments, uh, which is one that just finished under the UN, is the World Ocean Assessment. There's one that will start uh, um, soon in I, with, within IPBES, which is the Intergovernmental Platform for the Biodiversity and Ecosystem Services. There's one, the Transboundary Water Assessment, funded by the Global Environment uh, uh, Facility. And the, there's also the Global Biodiversity Outlook uh, uh, Assessments, uh, publications published by the CBD Convention on Biological Diversity. So there's lots of assessments going on. There's a lot, lots of need of information. The countries need to, there are a number of reporting obligations by countries. Uh, so that's something that we, we want to support the countries in. So if you think about indicators that we can produce, like the most obvious are, where are the biodiversity hotspots? Where are the most threatened species? Uh, where are the, the biggest gaps of our knowledge? Can we detect marine species extinctions? Uh, are the pop population size changes? Other a bit more difficult things, but very important, is are the changes in the community structure. Um, if you just look at number of records, then that's not a good indicator of how the species is doing. If you, for example, look here at the Fulmer species, in the 90s we have, uh, it was the most recorded, most observed species in Obus. But then if you look at the relative abundance, so the, the number of records compared to other uh, bird species, it was actually decreasing, so it was actually losing its position within the seabird community. Other questions that we can uh, ask ourselves is, uh, because most of the species are rare, uh, let's try to look at the most common species and see if there are trends there. So what we did, so are the most common species always the most common? That's a question we can ask ourselves. So what we did is, and it's very difficult to see, but I will explain to you. So we have listed the most common, the 20 most common species per 10 taxonomic groups. and this is the per decade and so this is the 1990s so we give all the most common 20 species uh, the rainbow colors and we compared of those species were also in the top 20 in the other decades so from, from 2000 to the 80s 70s and 60s and then you can see well the top red has often remains the top red and uh, maybe the the purple blue at, at the bottom remains kind of purple-blue in the other decades, but there's a lot of gray. So gray means that the species was not in the top 20 in the 1990s. So there's a lot of drop out and drop in of, of species. So there are changes. So now it's the question is, are these true changes or is this just due to sampling bias? Is it just due to um, yeah, sampling effort? Uh, just the nature of the, of the data in, in all this. Another, uh, another uh, number of applications, uh, and I'll give you uh, a few examples of where data in OBIS has been used, is to avoid ship strikes with whales by predicting the density of cetaceans of marine mammals. So and one of the examples is in the east coast of the US, they have uh, two decades of data, both airborne and, and ship-based, uh, of cetaceans, so it's a huge data set. They have um, integrated that with oceanographic uh, data. They've done some analysis to predict absence and, and presence of, the, of those species. So they now have a clear tool which uh, provides the, the density of, of, of whales, fin whales, etc., uh, in the coastline. And that's currently used to uh, inform the shipping industry that. Uh, that within one week or within two weeks there will be a very high density of fin whales because they all mi migrate and they all come together at certain times of the year when the circum circumstances are ideal. So they can actually move their shipping lines a bit further so that they can avoid the, the core density of the, of the fin whales. Another uh, application is here is we predict the viable habitat of Theropods. The theropods are sea 
butterflies, uh, very small sea snails, but a very important food source for salmon or, or commercial fish, fish stocks. And, but they are also very vulnerable to ocean acidification, and we all know that the ocean is getting more and more acid. And so if you look at the CMAP5 uh, scenarios of the IPCC, then we, we can actually predict that the habitat of theropods is actually going to, to decrease, decrease very much. So everything is that's red, is, uh, theropods will not be able to survive. So only the blue and maybe the green areas are, uh, are, are um, suitable habitat for those species. Global warming, and I don't know if you you, may, you might have seen this uh, picture recently. This is the picture of uh, from NASA from October 2015. It was the hottest month on record globally, except for Iceland. I, he I hear, and there is you can see the the blue area. The, the Iceland is very cold and much much snow at the moment. Uh, so we looked at the tropical species uh, in Obis. So we we took the 14 most common species for which we have lots of data before the 1990s and after the 1990s. So you can see the, the population uh, density abundance was really around the equator in the 1990s, before the 1990s. And if you look at the, the sample after the 1990s, you can actually see that the populations are splitting. And they're splitting by more than 500 kilometers away. Um, so that's a, already a clear sign that we can see from Obis that uh, species are moving towards the poles. And uh, it's because it's just getting too hot for them. Uh, I already said that one of the mandates, one of the purposes of OBIS is to support uh, conservation and uh, establishing pr protected marine areas. So the number of uh, international bodies that are assigning special areas. Uh, the International Seabed Authority, for example, is establishing the areas of particular environmental interest, the APIs. Probably the most uh, known areas are the UNESCO World Heritage Sites. Also, FEO uh, is uh, setting up the vulnerable marine ecosystem areas. Uh, IMO, the International Maritime Organization, has their own areas called particularly sensitive sea areas. And the CBD, Conventional Biological Diversity, have the APSAs, the ecologically or biologically significant areas. And as, uh, I'll give an example, uh, because, because we were asked by the Conference of the Parties of the CBD to support the at APSA process. So they are organizing a number of regional workshops, uh, so by inviting the experts of the region uh, to, to define what are the most uh, ecologically, biologically uh, important areas. And one of the one of the main sources of information is OBIS. And here is an example where one of the EPSAs uh, clearly matched the the diversity uh, data from OBIS. So this is what it is at the moment. The countries, uh, so it's 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 a long process. I think in a few weeks they have one more workshop in for uh, South Asia and China. Um, I think 75% of the of the ocean is covered at the moment by this process. So these are the the areas that are uh, I think all approved at the moment by the countries. So as I said, we we. We try to support a number of international processes. I already mentioned the four uh, ocean assessments. I have men mentioned the, the EPSA uh, process by the CBD. But you also have the regional fisheries bodies. So lots of the OBIS nodes have very good interactions with those fisheries uh, uh, bodies uh, as part of FEO. We also try uh, the process of assembling an agreement uh, of cooperation with the International Seabed Authority to build a deep sea um, a portal, because they are the ones who provide licenses for deep sea mining. And but to do deep sea mining, you need to, to know exactly what the impact is of deep sea mining on the local biodiversity. So they need uh, data on biodiversity for that. And there is an important process at the moment uh, in New York uh, under the United Nations Convention Law of the Sea, uh, UNCLOS. Uh, they are ne negotiating a new uh, legally binding instrument or implementing agreement to conserve and sustainably use biodiversity in areas beyond national jurisdiction and the high seas. It's called the BBNJ. Uh, so there, uh, it's very likely that uh, both UNEP, FEO, uh, Interacement Authority, and uh, maybe also IOC with OBIS will have a key role 
in uh, the, that uh, uh, new agreement. Then um, two processes to to try to uh, establish um, provide guidelines on what we need to measure and and how we should court and organize ourselves is part of GeoBond and Goose. Uh, GeoBond, uh, the Biodiversity Observation Network of Geo, the global er uh, global Earth uh, group on Earth observations. Sorry. So they are in the process of uh, identifying EBVs, essential biodiversity variables, and establishing MBONs, marine biodiversity observation networks. And they're also building a toolbox, bond in a box, how you set up a, a marine biodiversity uh, network. So um, at the moment, I think they will launch, or they just have launched one the toolbox in Latin America, which is uh, done very much in combination with NVMR in Colombia. Then uh, Goose, so we have recently established a new panel in Goose, the Biology and Ecosystems panel of the Global Ocean Observing System. So we had, Goose was very much, very strong in physics and climate, already for uh, more than 10 years. So, some years ago they established the Biogeochemistry panel, and now they established a, a Biology and Ecosystems panel. And there we are identifying the most important uh, ecological EOVs, the essential ocean variables. So, um, and try and try to expand the use the existing uh, observing systems and make them um, uh, uh, make them so strong that they apply to the criteria of goose, which means that they really serve the societal needs. That's an important. It's not just we don't want to just measure everything uh, and not just for the sake of knowing. We really want to do measurements that can have applications, that can have improvements in management, that can. So, can benefit society. That's important for goose. And then building indicators, we work, uh, and that's also an important uh, new initiative, Future Earth, uh, that will that sees itself as bridging science with policy, to, uh, so that will have a role within IPBES, for example, to provide science uh, layer to the intergovernmental platform on biodiversity and ecosystem services. Of course, Opus, we do training. Uh, we had two training courses last year, one for particularly for Africa and one for the Opus nodes. And we have another one uh, this week uh, with participants from all over the world. And this is my last slide. If you're active on social media, you can follow us, uh, for example, on LinkedIn, on Twitter, on Facebook, and presentations, I post them on SlideShare. All right. So I think this was a lot of information.